Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the data talk session from the European Data Portal and the Support Center for Data Sharing. I'm happy to introduce our two speakers today, Mira Nayar from the Department for Transport in the UK and Johan Herlin from ITO World. If I pronounce your name incorrectly, please also reintroduce yourself and correct uh, my pronunciation when I give you the floor to introduce yourself. Both will be talking about the Bus Open Data Service in the UK, which is a new initiative that was launched earlier this year and that will focus on open data for transport in the UK. For everyone's awareness, this session is going to be recorded and it'll be made live next week on Monday for those who want to rewatch it or and for those who could not unfortunately join us. If you have any questions, please feel free to share it in the chat or to raise your hand and ask our two speakers as we go. To Mira and Johan, the floor is yours. So um, I'm Mira Naya, um, I'm the Head of Passenger Experience in Local Transport at the Department for Transport in the UK. Yeah, and hi everyone, my name is Johan. Um, I am the CEO of uh, ETO World. Uh, we are a uh, transit uh, data specialist company. Um, and we, uh, we do really two things. We uh, are an aggregator of transportation data, such as public transport and micromobility for the likes of um, Apple Maps and Google Maps and other um, sort of smaller, smaller organizations um, that are delivering a journey planning experience for their customers. And we also have a uh, software platform that we deliver to uh, cities, agencies, and, and operators um, uh, for, for, for doing similar kind of work, but uh, for the agencies themselves. Uh, we've been working with uh, DFT for a couple of years now on the, the, the bus open data uh, project that, that Mira will uh, give an, uh, an overview of uh, next, I think. Would you like to kick it off, Mira, and um, discuss what the bus open data service is, how the initiative was conceived, and what's happening in the UK right now? Yeah, no, thanks, Um Yeah, so I think, um, so I suppose the starting point for a lot of this would have been the Bus Services Act, which was the first major piece of legislation um, that was passed in the UK to, for the, um, to regulate the bus industry, um, which is, you know, in the UK, the, the bus industry is largely deregulated. Um, to give you a sense of the economic context, the, the bus industry is an industry that has been in decline in the UK. Um, so we've seen a decline in patronage year on year um, since about 2009 um, the competition commission um, or um, the competition and markets authority as it's now known um, conducted an investigation into that decline and um, really open data was one of the, the key measures that they recommended to give consumers more choice and to help them find best value tickets um, so when we created the bus services act and the legislation back in 2017 was a section in there that enabled the, um, the Department of Transport and Secretary of State to legally require bus operators to openly publish data about local bus services across the country. Um, and that included timetables, fares, and location data as well. Um, I think just from a kind of, I suppose, a passenger perspective, a lot of the evidence that we have through um, the, the, the passenger watchdog, transport focus, highlights the, the need for um, better and increasingly centralized data um, about local bus services for passengers. Um, and certainly what we've seen in areas like London, for example, um, so, so Transport for London took a policy decision um, as far back as 2007. And um, the longitudinal evaluation in 2017 demonstrated that the value of TFL's open data generated about 130 million um, pounds per annum um, in terms of benefits, so productivity benefits, um, job creation, etc. And so we really do feel that um, bus open data is uh, an important stimulus for um, both the economy, but also for helping the bus industry to, to return to growth. Beyond um, the recognition and the understanding of the decline of the bus industry in the UK at that moment, and the importance of it to be stimulated and to continue growing. How did the DFT and by extension ITO world get involved or be inspired to start using open data 
and how was that translated to collecting or in publishing open data across the UK? I imagine that there are quite different standards and quite different uh, methods of doing that. Johan, do you want to respond to that one first? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've been involved in, uh, as, as both consumers of open data and helping organizations produce open data for, for, for many years. So we've worked with other uh, areas within the UK to sort of successfully help them open up their data. And we've seen them sort of reap uh, some of the benefits of this. And Mira can give some of the details around how that's, that's worked out for the West Midlands, for instance. Um, we, I think one of the key things um, that, that's a little bit different that might be a way to compare and contrast what uh, Mira and her team have, have taken on uh, versus what other many other European um, governments have done is that it is she's sort of taken it beyond a directory service where it points to you know the, the source data and you have to go to each location to go get that source data. It's quite a different implementation and it's much more comprehensive and delivers uh, something that's much more useful. Uh, for, for the for the end users as, as a result of that. So the UK market is quite complex. There are about 700 uh, individual operators, bus operators in, the U, in, in England uh, that are running about 34,000 buses every day, right? So, it, so it's a big market with many, many, many different players and they're all, you know, they're, they're competing. It's a private, private uh, market. So it is a particularly complex environment in which to operate and as a result, um, you know, th there needs to be a little bit more help from the government to make that data easily available to the sort of downstream consumers of that data. So um, what, what's actually being delivered as part of this is a way for the individual operators to upload the data uh, to the portal. That data then um, gets run through a sort of a battery of tests to deliver a quality report back to the operators so they can understand where they may be of maybe some uh, issues with the data we flag potential problems they can then use their own tools to resolve those problems if they want to and then they can re-upload it run the tests again when they're happy with it they can then choose to go to publish that um, all of that scheduled data is actually being delivered in in, in trans exchange and that's that's by legislation um, the 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 real-time data the sort of vehicle location data is delivered in a number of different uh, slightly different formats but then on the back end, we're reconciling that into a single um, format and, and deliver that out by default sort of as Siri. And then the uh, fares data will be uploaded in, in, in NetX and, and we'll deliver that out as, as NetX as well. But what we described there are three different types of data for schedules, for real time and for fares. But we don't, consumers don't necessarily want those in three different formats, right? So th there has to be a process to reconcile those. So on the back end, we also have a set of services that ingest those into a model and then matches the real time data to the schedules and then delivers a nationwide view that is deduped and, and, and uh, overlaps have been removed uh, in whatever format we want. So the most commonly consumed format is gonna be presumably GTPS and GTPS RT with vehicle positions associated with that. And that'll be for the whole country, and then it can be obviously filtered down to whatever level that that that's required. But as a result of this, there's some quality assurance that gets baked into this. There's some sort of removing of duplicate journeys. There's the simplification of delivering sort of a single nationwide view uh, in the model, and then uh, we can push downstream to the consumers in any format that they really want, um, which is quite an ambitious project. But as a result, we're hoping to deliver something that's immediately useful by the sort of consuming market of this. Yeah, um, so I would say just to, to add a bit more context to what Johan, uh, everything Johan said is absolutely right. And, and just to kind of, I suppose, give some of the background or the backstory to how we made some of the decisions. Um, I think um, actually Gianfranco um, was, was a, a key um, figure in, in, in the, did the earlier stages of the bus open data program um, and worked with us to deliver a discovery project to help us think about the data standards landscape in the UK. Um, so there's apps, I, I think, you know, actually taking the time to deliver the discovery was of fundamental importance. Um, 
And um, yeah, I think you know, we, in the UK, we're in a slightly different position to some of our European counterparts. And so we have a deregulated industry. It's been deregulated since the 1980s. And that means bus operators have the freedom to choose um, you know, for example, how, how, how they provide passenger information, uh, how, how they run their bus services. And so um, one of the things that really came through to us in the, the, in, at the discovery stage was that we asked bus operators and also local authorities and data consumers what, what they wanted um, in terms of the role of government. And um, the, the strong message that came through was that they wanted greater leadership from the government on data standards to to utilize and that currently the the data landscape and um, the data standards landscape in in, in england is a bit um very fragmented and, and essentially quite messy um so so yeah so, so so we took some decisions quite early on um and a big factor in in our decision making was you know essentially our regular we were regulating and creating legislation to require bus operators to publish this data and so what that meant was it needed to actually work for the bus operators it needed to be something that could be implemented and that they they actually were you know st were statutory requirements that they were able to meet um because otherwise we're at risk of um going through um so, so probably have similar processes in europe um, but judicial reviews etc and so um, we selected industry specific standards like Trans Exchange um, and also um, Siri for the location data. Um, the, the interesting one was, um, so, so FERS data was a real um, gap in our provision. And um, so in the UK, we, we already had largely open timetable data. We had about a half complete, a half baked data set um, for, for location straight real time data, but we had no first data that was openly provided um, in this country. And um, the real challenge or barrier had been around the lack of an agreed national publishing standard for first data. Um, the, we do um, participate in the MTIS programme, which some of you will um, be familiar with. Um, so that's an um, European Commission um, program, um, delegated regulation, and as part of that, um, we were um, received grant funding to create a NetEx um, data standard, which was um, very, very much appreciated. Um, and so we, you know, one of the big, um, one of the really important milestones for the program was the delivery of the the NetEx data standard in the UK. Um, it's specifically being utilised for buses data and FERS data in particular, but we are looking um, to see how we roll that out to timetables. And, and there's a real, I suppose, a real desire from the bus operators and the bus industry to see NetEx rolled out more broadly. Um, the interoperability across countries, across member states, and also the multimodal modal nature of NetEx made it you know, inherently appealing um, as a data standard. And, and we do believe that it, it, it is a, a future-proof data standard and, and you know, currently, although um, we won't be required to, 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 to implement NetEx, we are certainly looking within DFT um, and across the data teams and across the roads as to how NetEx could be utilised in the multimodal space. Thank you. How Another part um, that was also briefly discussed in the blog post that you have written about the Bus Open Data Service and was that this um, work you're doing and deliveries that are coming from this initiative will contribute to the government's manifesto commitment to open data from 2020 onwards. So what, um, what does this entail and what is beyond the, D the BODS for the UK government going forward? Um, yeah, I think um, that's a yeah, really great question. Um, I should say that um, um, I, think, I think Amy is on the call, um, but it was actually Amy Bridge who, who wrote the, the article. Um, but in terms of the, the manifesto commitment, and so, so it was a manifesto commitment back in 2015 and 2017 for the Conservative government in the UK, um, real um, desire to openly publish more data about local services. Um, and to improve the delivery of days local services um, through, through, through digital data. Um, it, I have to be perfectly honest with you, um, it's not a current manifesto commitment, um, but it is, a commit, it is something that the government are incredibly committed to as a BAU type service. And digital and data uh, are probably similar to lots of other European governments. We're currently going through our spending um, review planning um, process at the moment. 
and digital and data is one of our biggest priorities um, and so um, you know I think in terms of what that means for bus open data we um, are currently about, we're about to, we, we launched the service back in January to openly publish timetables data the service will technically go live in January 2021 with timetables first and location data and then beyond that, we'll look to, to consider how, how we can incorporate other types of data into that service, other modes, and, and really shift the focus away from bus to, 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 to more like public transport. Um, Johan, I don't know if you've got anything, um, do, any reflections from an ETO perspective? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think, um, so, so there's no, there's no sort of um, technical limitation in terms of the architecture that, that, that's been built that, um, that uh, prevents it from growing geographically to cover not just England, but the devolved nations of the, the, the UK and, and uh, or to use other modes, right? So it's, it's agnostic to the data types it is, uh, that, that are input into the system and it is agnostic to the modes. And, and it's agnostic to the outputs, right? So that's sort of the idea that um, any data can be loaded in and, um, and, and any data can be pushed out and transformed into whatever format that's needed by the industry in order to make the most of it. Um, so ho hopefully that kind of reduces any dependency on, on, on needs that are, are here today, but, but may change uh, in the future as well. Thank you. I also want to open the floor to the audience if they have any questions or if they want to jump in to something that you touched upon already that they would like more details in. I lead them to either share in the chat or to jump in by unmuting themselves. Otherwise, I do have a few other questions. Um, for starters going, so we know that there are several benefits to publishing more data as open and you already list, uh, mentioned some, for example, over 130 million pounds annually from publishing data is open and from the transport um, services in the UK. Beyond this quantitative and immediate benefit, what are some of the long-term benefits that you've noticed already observed by these data providers publishing these data sets as open? Um, yep. <laughs> who wants to start? You're more than welcome to, Mayor. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so I think there's, um, yeah, I, I suppose some, the really element of um, bus open data is, yeah, I think, you know, going beyond standard journey planning and feeding the data into journey planners, which is what the, the service was originally conceived to do, um, is actually realising some of the true innovation benefits. So I'm um, seeing what could be created that nobody had ever possibly conceived of before. Um, and so I suppose some of the discussions that we're having at the moment are, I mean, Johan mentioned one yesterday, which um, I'll probably uh, um, let Johan elaborate on a bit more, but looking at digital transformation of um, essentially the, the process of government and how you use the, the data to, um, to digitally transform some of our delivery functions. Um, but actually, you know, going into next year when we have a, a, a live location data set, um, one of the things that my team in particular will be really focused on is um, innovation and what we can do to work with the, the transport tech sector to really stimulate and nurture that transport tech sector in the UK and encourage them to, to um, utilise the data being provided in BODS to deliver um, you know, any, any range of innovation. But I suppose some of the big challenges that we're, we're grappling with at the moment in government are really... Uh, probably the same as many of you, um, decarbonisation and clean air. And so you know, how, how do we um, use, for example, bus live location data to provide technology to the bus industry to help them optimise um, EV and, and um, you know, low emission buses and zero emission buses and battery charging. And then also just things like route optimization technologies for local authorities. Um, you know, the, the, yeah, the, there's a whole range of innovations that can be delivered. Um, but yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think that'll be the, the kind of, I suppose, interesting space that we'll enter into next year. And um, Johan, do you want to say a little bit about the digital transformation? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think when you talk about open data in general, um, most people tend to think of the sort of canonical use cases, which is sort of the, the developer community that consumes those services and creates innovative end user products that hopefully drive efficiency and create a better passenger experience and, you know, uh, generate the sort of economic benefits that, that, that Mira mentioned. And of course, those are incredibly important. And those are sort of the most, I guess, obvious and, and visible benefits of, of opening up data. But what we've always found when we work with organizations to help, to help them open up their data um, is that the process of opening up the data um, creates many, many benefits for the organization uh, that's, actually, that, that, that's actually performing that process. So um, by, by, by opening up the data, you're forced to get better uh, processes in place, better data in place, better standards in place, and so on. And that has lots and lots of downstream um, benefits that are less visible, right? So, you know, we think about it as there are straight economic benefits that Mira talked about. There are uh, many, many passenger benefits of uh, getting this data out as broadly as possible and into the hands of, of, of passengers. And then of course there are governance benefits. So now that all this data is produced and that it's organized and that it's, uh, you know, real time is matched to, to, to schedules and so on and so forth, um, we can actually begin to archive all of that data and then do reporting and analysis on both the real time and the historical data. And this is at a nationwide level, right? So um, uh, part of this will be delivering sort of uh, the, the, the network analysis and, 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 and performance um, metrics and, and, and sort of a dashboard that is used by national government, by local government, by regulators and by operators themselves. And of course, because all of this data is being ingested, um, uh, we, can, we can leverage that to help sort of digitally transform some of those uh, organizations. So you can think about you know, the, the regulators that have to worry about, you know, our bus is really performing on time, our operators performing to the level that, that they said they were going to and so on and so forth, or if they get complaints, perhaps, how do they verify those things? It's quite challenging to do if you don't have your sort of finger on the pulse of what's going on within a large bus network of 700 operators. But in the future, they're simply just going to be able to go to this data set and query either what's going on right now, what happened last week, last month, at this particular day on this street for this bus stop and so on and so forth. They'll have all of that data at their fingertips and the tools to exploit that data and, 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 and ask those questions. So th that's quite a significant change from the way it's been uh, in, in the past. So I think that's a huge benefit that's of, often overlooked. And then I think the other thing is, you know, normally if you just kind of let this all, you know, be, the, be handled by the private market, we tend to see that main cities like London and so on and so forth are served really well by that because it's a huge market and private organizations can in, get in there, do all the work that's required uh, to, to produce an app and, and get at that data because it's, it sort of makes sense for them economically to do so in a huge market. But in more rural areas or even, you know, areas that aren't super dense like London, we see that they just, they don't, they don't do that because it's too much work, right? So, the, you know, opening up this data in a way that um, at a nationwide level um, is very significant, right? Because it sort of levels the playing field for organizations to go in anywhere um, uh, within, within the country and be able to create these apps and, and, and improve passenger experience, even in areas that aren't super um, densely populated like London. So I think that sort of like geographic equity is super important to help stimulate um, innovation in, in, in non-dense urban environments as well. Do you know of um, other initiatives in different countries in Europe that are doing something similar? So yeah, I think, I mean, for, well, for example, Finland created their multimodal legislation and so that was you know, essentially included a clause in you know, no data, no service, basically, is so there anyone wanting to operate um, transport services, as public transport services, as I understand it, were required to openly publish their data as a condition and also to um, sign up um, to, to work with one man's type provider. Um, and then similarly, to, to be honest, as part of the MTS program um, across Europe, um, I think there's at least 17 member states participated in MTS, the Multimodal Travel Information Services program. And um, yeah, I suppose the three main conditions um, attached to participating in MTS is 
um, for, for member states rather than the observer states or um, the um, implementation of the delegated regulation so basically requiring operators to openly publish data using the NetX data standard and um, the creation of um, a country level profile for the NetX data standard and also the creation of a NAP um, or as some countries have taken it upon themselves to do so the creation of multiple NAPs and um, the UK is one of those countries that will end up having multiple NAPs um, and so, 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 yeah, so I think essentially there's a whole range of countries who are creating um, open data platforms, regulations and data standards to drive forward the open publication of data. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to be honest, um, I can probably dig out the contact details for the person who's leading MTIS now um, in the European Commission, but that has been a bit, a bit of changeover. But um, yeah, I mean, you, um, I think Norway, um, Finland, uh, yeah, there were a whole host of countries, 17 total, who were participating in that. Um, each have really interesting and different stories to tell. Thank you. Also good for us to investigate and also to see what else is being done out there. Can you share information about the economics of the service, especially for small bus operators? And are there ways of making it financially operationally easy for these small firms? Yeah, I, um, I think that's a really great question, to be honest. Um, and I think it's something we've had to have really at the forefront of our minds from the start. Um, so, yeah, all, all primary legislation set out at the start, there would be no exemptions, i.e. all operators of all sizes um, would be required to participate and to openly provide data. And so I suppose what that meant was we needed to provide a, a, a service that created a bit of a level playing field. Um, in terms of how that's practically translated, um, there's a few things that we've done. Um, we've prioritised smaller operators as part of our user research from day one. Um, we've worked with a few local authorities who have a high proportion of smaller operators. Um, so rural local authorities in particular tend to have lots of smaller operators who serve them. Um, so, so smaller operators have been priority in terms of our use of research activity and then in terms of the actual um, the design of the service itself um, so there's been two things um, we have enabled operators to provide data either via an API or through a URL link um, or um, which suits the, the, the larger and the medium sized operators and some of the smaller operators who are a bit more tech savvy or have more resources uh, but some of the smallest and the micro operators really don't are, aren't able to provide data in that way and need um, tools, first of all, to help them create data in the first instance. So, so, so to solve the upstream data creation issue, and we have given them access to free tools to help them create their timetables and first data in particular. Um, the, and then um, we have also given them the option to um, upload their data. As a, um, as a file upload, it's essentially a CSV or an Excel upload. Um, and that suits particularly the micro operators, um, especially. So, so that, that's really played out in the service design. Um, other things that we've done, we've offered free hosting for smaller operators as well to make sure that um, you know, operators who wouldn't know how to set up a, ho a hosted site and don't already have a hosted site can, can um, host their data. Um, and more recently, we started to build agent mode functionality in the service, which um, essentially enables the local authority to assume publishing responsibility for the operator. And that will disproportionately benefit the smaller operators. Um, so, so I think there's a yeah, whole um, range of things that we have done to support smaller operators. But I think you're absolutely right to highlight that. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, enabling smaller operators to, to, to participate is a, a you know, major challenge and um, it has to be overcome and um, you, you know you, you will know yourself anyone who's involved in open data that getting the data onto a service is easy maintaining and updating the data and keeping it of the highest quality is, is the more difficult challenging part and it's smaller operators who really are going to need the most support here um, which is why agent we think agent mode is just fundamental um, to, to um, having a, a high quality, accurate and up-to-date data set on boards. Um, Johan, I don't know if you want to... Yeah, no, I think, I think you answered it really well. I, I think the, the point for me was that 
um, as Mir and the team were conceiving this thing, um, small operators were front and center and definitely not an afterthought in this, right? So, because it's an incredibly long tail, as you can imagine, with hundreds of operators uh, in, in the UK market, there are a number of big ones and then there's lots and lots and lots of small ones, right? So, so it was baked into the, the, the thinking and, and, and the design right from the beginning, which I think is really key to this being um, uh, a, a successful. Um, when working with those small folks. I, I think the other thing is some of those data quality tools are also really helpful for that audience because um, it allows them to create some data, uh, upload it, test it, make sure that they can see any flags that get raised with that data and then resolve those and so on and so forth. And so that becomes sort of a baked in learning process for that. And the same thing is gonna be true for the, for the, the real time data There's gonna be, um, you know, actually monitoring and alerting mechanism. So if half the, the, um, the, 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 the buses drop out of a feed, they're gonna be alerted, the operators will be alerted and they'll be told that there's something wrong with the feed. And, and obviously smaller operators simply don't have those kinds of mechanisms on their own. And so getting that through a, a centralized system is, is, is very, very useful for them. So I think there are a number of um, specific improvements that will help those folks. There's a follow-up question to that um, and a thanks for the reply. The follow-up is, in terms of longer-term vision, will payments and integrated multimodal ticketing, will they be a feature in your roadmap as it raises new issues for fares data and dynamic pricing, or is it legitimately out of scope for the UK? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a really great question, actually. Um, yeah, so I think there's de def definitely a, a, I mean, essentially, you, you you term yourself integrated and smart ticketing um open data and smart ticketing go hand in hand um it's um you know open data sits as part of the essentially the integrated and smart ticketing team in england and similarly in scotland and wales and um, so it's absolutely the next step for us um the uh, for some of you who are very clued up on um uk politics um you'll know that um, the current government are really, um, really passionate about buses. Actually, it's a really great time to be in local transport and um, to, to work with buses. Um, there's a real desire to to stimulate the bus market. Um, and last September, um, there were essentially there were some quite public announcements about increased funding for the sector. Um, but also some commitments that were required um, in return for that funding and in particular contactless and multi-op ticketing was one of those commitments and um, so we are currently considering how we support the industry to become 100% contactless um, and how that might work in practice um, and I, I would not say it's a priority this year um, I can see it becoming an increasing priority next year um, and then as part of that, once you have then enabled the industry to become 100% contactless and, and upgraded their tech um, or, or supported them to upgrade their own tech, then um, how then do you encourage them or expedite the move towards multi-op ticketing? And, and, and bus open data does achieve that to some extent in the creation of first um, data standards and, and um, requiring the industry to create that data in the first instance. But um, you do also need the operators to participate in schemes and you know in a deregulated market space the major challenge has always been about um yeah we have um supporting the industry to reach agreements about um essentially profit share um johan i don't know if you have anything from a tech perspective you wanted to add um maybe from a mouse perspective well, i guess so the only thing i would say is that <clears throat> um of 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 course the vision of an integrated ticketing um, uh, system ac across a whole nation is 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 great, right? And um, it, it is particularly challenging in in a de deregulated market um, such as the UK. So I think it will take a while to 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 get there if 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 we ever do get there. But I think to me the steps of that the BODS is taking is building this sort of foundational layer that enables all of that innovation to happen when the, if, if as and when the industry is ready for that uh, to occur and whatever legislation needs to come to support that and so on and so forth. But it's, it's sort of, it, it's the next step after having created, you know, the, the bus open data service integrating, you know, multi-modes and so on and so forth and making it accessible everywhere. Then, you know, 
what else can be done and, and clearly ticketing is on 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 the horizon but but it is a very particularly complex issue in the, in this market uh, I, I think that's all i have to say about that thank you for your answer um in light of time i think we can open it to one more question from the audience if anyone wants to come in to ask either on chat or through their audio the last question for those who still want to stay is um, the arrangement as described takes the SRI net X data and dupes to GTFS, GTFS RT. Is it possible to go straight to GTFS? Um, yeah, so, so um, I, 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 I should make sure I understand the question uh, properly before I answer it. But my understanding is that um, you're asking whether it's possible to get the raw data, so to speak, in GTFS without removing the overlapping services. Um, it is cert certainly would be possible to do that, though that is not um, uh, what we're planning on delivering uh, initially. But there's no, you know, that that's a that's just a decision that was made about creating the best user experience for the scenario in mind. Um, the the main, the main thrust of it is that um, we can ingest any data in whatever format it's in. And because we are um, uh, ingesting it into a model, we can then transform the data into any output. The sort of deduping and removing of overlap simply creates a um, regionally clean data set that doesn't um, uh, confuse journey planners um, downstream. Now, GTFS and GTFS RT won't, are not the only um, formats that are available so you can get the individual um, files that have been uh, uploaded as trans exchange and you can get the Siri uh, real-time directly as well ag aggregated to the whole nation or queried by region or, or, or by operator and so on and so forth so th there are lots of different ways to get to the data but there there hasn't we haven't envisioned uh, just translating the individual trans exchange files into um, into uh, G GTFS. Um, there hasn't been a requirement to do that um, to date, but, but it's technically um, relatively trivial. Thank you very much, uh, Johan. And thank you very much, everyone, for the, Johan and Mira, especially for the very interesting talks and for your insights from both the political and governance perspective and from the technical perspective. Um, this video will be live and shared next uh, Monday, as I stated earlier. For those who have not yet already, um, there is also a blog post written on the European Data Portal Country Insights UK page that actually discusses the bus open data service and complements this session. If you have any additional questions for our speakers or for the team, please reach out to us and we can put people in touch. In the meantime, have a great day and uh, the rest of your week. And thank you, everyone. Bye. -bye. Hey, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.